All right, I think we've got a critical mass. My name is Arthur, and I'm an associate board member of the SPNL, as well as a senior freight analyst at Vortexa. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce the 99th SPNL event, the effects of analytics in the maritime industry. Our partner Vortexa is our first freight analytics partner, and that says a lot about the changes that the industry is experiencing. I'm now going to pass on to the moderator of this event today, Yanis. Take it away, Yanis. Thank you very much, uh, Arthur. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today to discuss a topic of increasing significance over the past few years, which is the impact of analytics in the maritime industry. Um, just a brief introduction. My name is Ioannis Papadimitriou, and I am a freight analyst in Vortexa. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Vortexa is an intelligent provider empowering players in the energy and freight world with real-time information and analytics. Now, uh, before getting into the discussion, I'll also hand over to the panelists for a brief introduction of who they are and what they do. Uh, let's start with you, Mikhail. Could you give us a brief introduction of uh, yourself, please? Mikhail, I think you're on mute. Yes. Hi, Ioanni. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I'm Michael. I'm currently working in uh, Peninsula's uh, Sustainability Division. Um, which is basically responsible for the company's uh, decarbonization strategy, as well as uh, developing alternative fuels solutions for vessel owners and operators. Perfect. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, Fotis, would you like to go next? Yeah, so my name is uh, Fotis. Uh, I work for ENI Trading and Shipping. Um, the last, I'm, I've been with the company the last uh, four years, I would say. The first two years I was in the gasoline desk, trading desk, uh, so overlooking the hedging and uh, the exposure. And um, the last two years I moved to NAFTA, uh, having more or less the same responsibilities and uh, doing also uh, some uh, macro analysis uh, for the desk and light ends. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, the, for this. Anastasia, last but not least. Uh, thank you very much. So, on, ladies first, next time, please. <laughs> You're right. <It's> a... <laughs> um, I'm Anastasia Zania. I joined Galbers at the start of 2020. Great timing. Um, I have been working as a tanker research analyst since uh, 2015, covering both the DPP and CPP tanker markets for vessels over 25,000 dead weight. Perfect. Uh, fantastic. Thank you guys for this. Uh, so, uh, before um, we begin, uh, the plan is to pose some questions for the panelists to initiate a discussion for the next 35 to 40 minutes or so, which uh, will probably leave us around 15 uh, to 20 minutes for Q&A. Anyone in the audience that wants to ask a question, please uh, do so in the Q&A section uh, below. Uh, so without uh, no further ado, uh, let's start with the first question. What do you think are the main reasons that gave birth to analytics? Mikhail, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, thank you, Ioanni. Uh, so I think that, uh, that like the broad reason would be the need to answer questions that have been left unanswered for, for too long in this uh, industry. Although maybe I would like to, to discuss this if I get the chance to, to describe how analytics are used in my daily workflow, for example. For the time being, I would like to, to focus on one issue, which is the consolidation as well as the, uh, the broader uh, uh, maturement of the shipping industry. So basically we have uh, bigger and bigger companies which leave uh, behind a bigger and bigger data footprint. Uh, so as a quick example, like I mentioned in the containers industry, that the top 10 operators controlled uh, about 60% of the total fleet capacity back in uh, 2010. And this percentage has now risen towards, let's say, uh, 85 or 90%. So we see bigger and bigger uh, companies and, uh, uh, and the need to analyze their data in order to, um, to gauge the landscape uh, is uh, a key reason that gave uh, birth to analytics in shipping for me. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, Anastasia, what is your view on the question? Um, 
I agree with Mikhail, and uh, I also think that uh, in today's digital age, competition also increases across industries um, at a high pace, and uh, companies need to engage and find um, efficient and effective ways and solutions that will assist them essentially uh, increasing their productivity at a relatively low cost. Um, as a result, we're currently going through a digital transformation, and uh, we see an increasing number of uh, market players making investments in new softwares and technologies, or even find innovative ways uh, to be part of the game and uh, prepare the themselves for any future developments. Perfect. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, what about you for this? What do you think? So, so in my view, what gave birth to analytics, first of all, is um, the emergence, I would say, of the less financially and technologically advanced countries across the globe. Uh, let's say, for instance, I want to give an example of uh, like some um, West African countries, uh, um, Eastern African countries and Latin American countries, as well as uh, Southeast Asian countries that um, they didn't have access to uh, and companies that uh, wanted to invest. They didn't have access to these uh, increased need of more complex analytics, I would say. So I think this, for me, was the main reason of, uh, let's say, um, the more advanced analytics, the need of more advanced analytics and the more precise, as well as to initiate new relationship with uh, local people, I mean, local data providers, which I think is important. Thank you, folks, for this. Uh, so, uh, I hear that uh, the, there is an agreement between you, but also like there could be a sort of um, divergence. I mean, on the, on the one hand, you know, like I hear that, you know, there is increased in competition and hence on the availability of data. Uh, but on the other, there is uh, analytics give competitive advantage on bigger companies, uh, probably. So, I'm wondering whether would you agree that uh, accessibility in data is more democratized currently, or if analytics has created a level play field. What do you think, uh, Mikhail? Uh, I, I do think that uh, analytics uh, are mostly used by the bigger players who see this as a tool to add marginal value and, uh, and get some sort of uh, competitive advantage. And the main reason is is twofold. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, these bigger players have a larger data footprint, so they have a lot more data at their disposal. And with so much data, it's only logical that there will be the need to analyze this data. Otherwise, it would all be lost. Uh, secondly, these bigger players, again, they attract uh, uh, another form of uh, talent that maybe shipping uh, was not accustomed to uh, historically. So we see more people uh, joining shipping companies from financial uh, institutions, they bring a new set of skills, a new set of uh, attitude, the general philosophy. So uh, I do think that these bigger players can leverage this advantage. The smaller players, uh, especially now that shipping is, uh, is coming um, of uh, a very, let's say, weak decade, uh, characterized by overcapacity in most uh, key subsectors, these smaller players uh, had uh, their focus mostly to survive to invest for the future, maybe, uh, etc. So they didn't really uh, have the, the luxury to focus on analytics. I see, I see. So you think it's uh, the bigger companies that have more resources that have the luxury to also like invest in analytics and gain competitive edge. Yeah, and answer okay. questions that others cannot answer and gaining the competitive edge uh, that way. Okay. Fotis Anastasia, you agree? Can go ahead if you like. Okay, I can go ahead. I th I think that the you know bigger companies, uh, they have let's say this privilege of uh, either making more substantial investments, okay, around the globe because big big companies they are operating around the globe, so you know, the, let's say. Uh, it's not regional. So I think that uh, they have this privilege through the investments to uh, making stronger relationships with uh, either local governments or uh, data providers and have, let's say, this exclusive 
uh, data flow and range that smaller companies could not, uh, could not, um, let's say, have. I see. Uh, thank you for this. Anastasia, would you like to add anything? Um, I totally agree with uh, all of you guys. And I also think like for the smaller companies, it's also, I mean, it has to do with the need for this kind of analytics. Um, a smaller company with a couple of vessels, obviously they don't, obviously, I mean, they might not have the same need as the big ship, ship uh, owning companies with a fleet of like, I don't know, over hundred vessels. Um, however, I'm pretty sure like even the smaller ones, they have some sort of analytics or the analy they're using the sort of analytics that are uh, needed for the daily uh, operations, at least of the vessels. I see. Thank you, Anastasia. So the takeaway from here, uh, I, I get that is that accessibility in data is democratized. It's more accessible for all the players, but uh, the the usage uh, of analytics is more ubiquitous in uh, in the big players, uh, owing to their resources and the need uh, of of analytics for their more bigger scale operations. Um, let's uh, let's proceed to the to the next question. Thank you for your answers. Uh, let's get now a bit more specific. I would like to know from your lens how analytics are applied in uh, your daily workflow. Uh, Anastasia, uh, this time I will be uh, a gentleman. I don't know if you want to start. Sure. Um, well, I have to say that um, significant changes have been made to the way we all do things compared to even even like five six years ago when I first started. Um, there is a trend across the whole industry, I will say, of moving away or, I mean, to be more precise, to integrate other softwares and data solutions into the usual Excel-based uh, spreadsheets. Um, as an example, for, uh, we used to have like a, a couple providers of AIS signals uh, and in order to track vessels around the globe. And the past few years, those providers have shortened both uh, numbers and level of sophistication um, to us and our brokers, like talking from a ship broking uh, perspective. Uh, the important thing is to manage to combine all this available information into our existing models um, in order to provide predictive analytic solutions uh, that will help our clients to make uh, informative decisions on the short to the long term. Okay, so as I understand, uh, as, as a broker like providing this predictive uh, analytics, uh, is is an important element for you, right? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, let's continue with you for this from our uh, recent talks. Uh, before I understand that, you know, um, as an oil major, you look at a wide range of information. So could you give us an insight of your daily so, yeah. workflow and how analytics is? Okay. I'll give an example because uh, we're using, let's say, a combination of analytics, of a combination of data in order to... Um, to, to to sum up and uh, you know get to a conclusion if you like for example uh, one of uh, an important an important task let's say is to get uh, a rough estimation of the supply demand balance for a certain product I would say NAFA because I'm in NAFA at the moment so you first uh, see at the at the demand side okay your biggest outlet is uh, is the petrochemical uh, petro is petrochemical companies a better chemical business. Uh, so uh, you have to see uh, you have to see the maintenance and the outages of the better chemical of the cracking of the crackers and uh, and the pet chems per se. And uh, then your other biggest outlet is uh, let's say the gasoline blending. Many naphtha stems fall into blending, uh, and then are formed into finished grade gasoline. Uh, so we use different uh, data from different providers in order to get, let's say, the demand in this occasion. And then we do the same for the supply. Uh, for the supply, we, we look at the, at the refinery side and the, the production field side as well. So uh, the maintenance of the refineries, the maintenance of the units, even more granulated analysis that we use more granulated data from different providers and also from in-house, let's say, um, analytics team. And uh, also, uh, 
is also is also very important the vessel tracking because this gives you let's say an idea of the how the flows are changing okay because by experience and um, prior to the beginning of each year you know uh, more or less the flow of the products but vessel tracking and the efficiency of the vessel tracking helps you understand how this flow changes and how this change can impact your model and your uh, let's say uh, analysis hence your supply demand balance i see thank you for this i can see a pretty extensive uh, usage uh, of analytics uh, and yeah. your workflow uh, Mikhail. Uh, so personally, I try to use analytics to, to understand the landscape, as I mentioned earlier, because essentially everything can be expressed in some sort of, uh, of data. So interpreting this data, you can actually understand uh, uh, what's going on and uh, even what is, uh, what is likely to happen in the future. So, uh, for example, uh, some of the things uh, I personally try to track uh, and interpret through uh, data and analytics is, for example, the refinery landscape the performance of the shipping markets, the shipping trade patterns, and actually then go one step further and try to link information among different databases. So for example, first you establish which shipping sector is uh, performing strong, uh, then you can narrow it down to subsectors, then you can actually map this information to your uh, customer portfolio. So combining uh, different uh, sources of data and from there, you can start to draw uh, further, more detailed conclusions. So, uh, yeah, the limit is uh, is the sky, basically, with, uh, with what you can interpret from data. I see. And, you know, these are uh, our usage, uh, the usage uh, of all these, Mikhail, if I understand correctly, is, you know, like, could be implemented further into decision-making or strategy. Yeah, exactly. After all, uh, there is no point to analyze uh, something just for the sake of analyzing it. Uh, uh, it's always wise to put uh, to put it into practice and make uh, educated uh, choices backed by data or some sort of analysis. Uh, I can expand on the commercial applications, uh, but I'm sure that we can we can discuss this uh, later in the discussion. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, thank you once again for your answers. Uh, just to recap once again, uh, from what I understand, you know, there is a, a wide range of benefits that assist you in your daily work lives. I mean, it could be like the accessibility, the processing, uh, the timeliness, the real-time flow of, of information, as well as the collation of data, as uh, Michael and uh, Foti said, but also, you know, like the, the forward-looking uh, view of analytics, for example, in Anastasia's and uh, Mikhail's case, uh, and this gives value to your workflows. Uh, but I would like now to stay on the decision-making and how analytics assist uh, in decision-making. And uh, the next question that I want to ask you all is, if you believe analytics have or will be developed a step further, and with that, I mean, instead of assisting in decision making, will analytics be able to propose their own actions or decision? And also, what other challenges uh, do you see currently in the application of analytics? Uh, Mikhail, I will start with you. Yeah, so of course, analytics can be uh, like, I personally believe that uh, this is just the beginning, that we have not even scratched the surface. First of all, as you mentioned, analytics currently does not have a role of uh, decision making. It helps others make educated decisions. Of course, shipping is a, uh, is a peculiar in the industry that perhaps uh, Fotis or Anastasia want to, to expand on. Uh, but looking at other industries, for example, uh, looking at the financial institutions, we see that, uh, uh, that it is now analytical tools that are more and more uh, making actual uh, exec executional um, uh, decisions with an actual output, let's say, a, a commercial uh, output. So yeah, of course, shipping is, uh, uh, is different in nature, very much uh, relationship-based, but uh, there is still a, ro a lot more room to go. And as a final example, uh, a quick one, I want to mention a tool I'm using, which basically scrapes the web and then um, uh, it gets information about specific topics, and that's how I have, let's say, a constant information flow about specific topics I target. So this could be sustainable fuels, this could be the shipping markets, this could be anything. Uh, 
but even even this, let's say, very analytical tool, it cannot recognize information based on concepts or notions. It just recognizes keywords. Uh, so this uh, example alone shows uh, the the potential for further growth. Thank you, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, for this, would you like to go next? Yeah, uh, so I think that analytics helped has have helped a lot, and especially in our day to day uh, work. But as far as I'm concerned, and uh, as like um, through my experience up to now, I think that still uh, the human experience in most of the cases outweighs these, let's say, computerized algorithms and all these uh, systems. Uh, because uh, I, I can give you some examples, uh, because information, as far as I'm concerned, again, um, cannot be fully filtered and, uh, let's say, being 100% uh, accurate from uh, most of the data providers. That means that uh, still, let's say, for example, um, vessel tracking companies, for instance, or uh, providers of um, secondary refinery units, which is more, let's say, a uh, bit more difficult to dig into it. Um, they don't have people with prior experience in order to filter the data and, uh, let's say, decide if it's correct, reasonable, wrong, uh, shouldn't be there, uh, should be excluded or uh, amended. So I think in, uh, through my experience, I don't see this, uh, let's say, absolute, um, let's say, uh, effectiveness of uh, analytics for the Thank time you. being. I see. Thank you. Thank you for this, for your insight. Uh, Anastasia, would you like to go next? Um, I think it's a case by case. Um, we have seen analytics uh, uh, taking informative, to use, using them like uh, as a um, proper forecasting or like making decisions out of them uh, in other industries. And I'm pretty sure even within the shipping industry, if we look at it from the big oil majors perspective, I'm pretty sure there are some established algorithms and models running on the back end for some of their business. However, um, from the ship owner or the ship broker, or especially for the more commercial, let's say, aspect of it, um, for now, and there is a huge um, uh, room for improvement there, um, I feel like it's still used as a, as a guide. Um, there is a there is a commercial argument and there is a, an extra information that people have uh, internally that they cannot be reflected into any model or any data that are available out there. And it is a relationship-based um, industry at the end of the day and things like sentiment, for example, we have seen it, um, what big of a role um, they play. So as an example, um, a year ago, like back in uh, April, May 2020, when we had this uh, huge uptick of uh, floating storage, um, I'm pretty sure everyone had access to this kind of data. Uh, you could see what was uh, being stored um, offshore on vessels. Um, however, being able to have this extra information internally from our side, for example, from our brokers with concluded DC fixtures, or with all the information related to those um, short-term DC fixtures with floating storage um, options, we were able to forecast, let's say, what is uh, coming back into the market in uh, what month's time, uh, or what will be uh, into floating storage in a month or a couple months time, which obviously was lagging, and you can see it in, in the available data out there after a couple months, um, just as an example. So. Yes, I do believe that for now and for the foreseeable future, um, people will use it as a guide um, in order to make informative decisions. Perfect, thank you, Anastasia. So yes, uh, as I understand human expertise for now, it is paramount. And uh, 
we will also, you know, like see that maybe some of the challenges are like industry related, as you said, we're talking about a relationship based industry and maybe at some point uh, technology, technologically net one. And yes, uh, further, furthermore, one of the greatest challenges that, as Fodi said, has to do you know, with the knowledge flow between industry experts and technology experts. And I totally agree with this point as well. And, you know, I've seen it as well from my uh, personal experience. And this is what, for example, we're trying to do in Vortex, is like try to marry the technology with market expertise to get reliable insights. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, try to, you know, break down the barriers between market and data analysts or other technology related posts uh, with the development of uh, knowledge sharing platforms, for example, such as uh, Vortex Academy. Um, now we talked, uh, you know, about the challenges of analytics. Let's talk about uh, a challenging period uh, we more or less went through, uh, which is the coronavirus pandemic. And I wanted to hear uh, your opinion on how analytics assist you or your company in navigating through uh, that period. Uh, Mikhail, I'll, I'll start with you. Thank you, Yanni. Again, with so much uh, volatility with COVID, analytics was the main tool that helped us uh, uh, gauge the landscape, as mentioned earlier, and navigate uh, this uncertainty. So uh, let me offer, let's say, uh, two very quick examples. First of all, on the demand side with our clients, uh, we were able to immediately, uh, immediately determine the performance of the shipping markets and then maybe uh, uh, which clients need uh, more support, which clients are safer from a credit risk perspective. So this is for the demand side. Uh, now also on the commercial side, analytics uh, gave us almost uh, real, um, uh, real time information on, uh, on developments. Uh, for example, a COVID resurgence in some region of the world, how this could affect our uh, operations there. Uh, looking at the vessel traffic, uh, is vessel traffic uh, directed? Uh, does it actually hit uh, this port? So all these uh, all these uh, small questions, uh, analytics were used to answer them and, uh, and navigate the the pandemic. Okay, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, Anastasia, uh, as per like uh, what you said uh, before, it's you know like on your case uh, how analytics. Uh, are distributed. Is there something additional that helped your your company in navigating through the pandemic period? I like how we, we refer to the pandemic in the past. But, <laughs> um, so to us, positive thoughts, I guess. <laughs> um, so to us, it was um, it was not really about analytics per se during uh, the past year or so. Um, but how you will manage to um, present this in a more user-friendly way and in a way that will attract uh, people and gain their attention. Um, I think we have all seen it that uh, during the past year or so, anyone can have access to great analytics, great reports, uh, webinars that are freely available out there. Um, so you had to go the extra mile in order to manage and communicate your research, uh, your results and your findings to your clients and be the one that people will pick out of uh, the many. Uh, to us, we also had the time, it was, it was mostly just the perfect timing, let's say, because we had already started um, developing some extra tools. And I would say that with the pandemic, we just had the opportunity and the extra time, if you wish, to uh, focus more on that and develop it a bit further. Thank you, thank you, Nastasia. For this, would you like to go next? Yeah, I think I totally agree with the guys and uh, especially with Mikhail that said this uh, keyword volatility. So I think the pandemic equals volatility. And um, if you were able to, uh, to have, let's say, uh, to make good use of uh, your analytics, as well as uh, have some uh, further information from your, from your regional offices across the globe, uh, you could actually be ahead of, uh, let's say, this um, deprived market, if you like. Um, in addition, I would like to say that what's very important through the pandemic is the emergence also of uh, some new tools, 
that for me they are very important and uh, they are tools that uh, their data that is uh, provided by companies like Apple or Microsoft, let's say the mobility data that you see uh, that Apple has uh, ameliorated and uh, is in, um, I mean, is, is very useful and, uh, and very efficient, help us understand, uh, let's say the COVID, um, the COVID spread and, um, and um, how critical is the situation in uh, certain countries and, and places worldwide. So I believe that this uh, in particular, this is an example. There are also many other examples that emerged through the pandemic, but uh, this mobility data, let's say, is something that will stay in our lives and uh, will be even and much and much better. Thank you, Fonte. I guess, yeah, new measures uh, call for new indicators in, uh, in this case. Yeah. So, yeah, I see that, you know, through, through your answers, we're coming back to, you know, uh, aspects we talked, like, uh, such as the data collection to give you a holistic view of the market, visualization and distribution, and combination with uh, the commerce and private information at Anastasia's case. Would it's, like also, yeah, it's also the quality it. of the data that has been improved because you had access to mobility data in the past or some sort of mobility, but now with COVID, uh, they have been, uh, the data has been so granulated and has been uh, much, much better than before. I mean, much more uh, efficient and uh, yeah, granulated, I would say. Yes. That's the word. So more focus on data quality. Uh, yeah, quality. Like yeah. tipping the, down, yes, yes. On the, on and more, more high frequency data. as well. So we yeah. went from the age where we were looking at monthly data now we're looking at weekly indicators, daily indicators, etc. Wow. And on a real-time flow, if I, if I may add, which actually gives, I think, especially in, you know, when you have like a, a pandemic to, to deal with, uh, as you said, you know, like there could be like supplier demand shocks, which can differ by region or clients, or for example, at 40 case, you know, like create the, the trade opportunities that you would not find elsewhere. And, you know, mm -hmm. this is where you have to act swiftly and nimbly and you yeah, can do this yeah. with real-time information perfect uh, thank you it is thank um you. yeah sorry no, it is a work right. in progress i mean when the whole thing started i feel like everyone was lost like you didn't know what to look at because uh, when you start at least from an analysis perspective whatever you do you all historicals and there was no such thing in this case even if you were looking in the beginning we were trying to compare it to pandemics at the start, like of the 19th century or something. Um, and then as the year progressed, then there was nothing that you could compare it with. And it was so much different from country to country um, that as we said, like uh, the quality of the data or the availability of the data was so much different for the Western world compared to uh, developed uh, countries, so. so. So yes, it was then also like the, the challenge that, you know, like was trying where analytics trying to focus uh, during the pandemic is, you know, like having all this data and how we could also like make sense of them or like how you can analyze them as well. Perfect. Thank you guys uh, for your answers. Um, let's continue now with a more forward looking question, which is uh, which area of shipping do you think is riper for analytics? Uh, Anastasia, would you like to go first? Uh... So that's a good question. Um, there is uh, definitely room for improvement uh, across uh, all sectors in the industry. Um, however, I feel like uh, companies have embraced this, or at least they're trying to. And to come back to the previous question, I think that the whole pandemic just brought this whole thing a bit forward. Uh, and like they have tried to embrace this not so new way of uh, doing things and whoever is not able to adapt will definitely be uh, left behind at the end of the day. So I don't think I'm able to pick one <laughs> specific um, side um, since I haven't and like have not seen the whole industry. Um, but yeah, there's definitely room for improvement, I think, across all sectors of the industry. Uh, obviously, we have the liner companies uh, that are much more sophisticated than Trump shipping or, again, coming down to the size of the company, for example. Uh, but I think that especially now that 
there is a new generation, let's say, coming on board, uh, I feel like we will see more and more changes. We have seen it in our daily lives that, for example, in our cases, how the new brokers that are coming on board, they try to combine fundamental information, they try to combine more and more tools in order to make, um, uh, to make up their minds and their decisions and offer to their clients the most they can. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, Mikhail, would you like to, to add? Yeah, sure. So it's the areas uh, which are, uh, you said, riper for analytics, right? Yes. So I think uh, what happens on board the vessel has uh, extreme potential, first of all. Uh, so yes, of course, the, the greater development has been offshore in the systems the companies use. Uh, there has not been, I, I, in my view at least, uh, uh, I'm not a, a marine engineer in, uh, in practice, although I studied, but uh, in my view, the vessels are still uh, lacking, um, uh, lagging significantly behind in terms of uh, technology. So this is an area, and we speak about alternative fuels, etc. And uh, of course, alternative fuels involve analytics, but uh, they are not, let's say, equ equivalent to, to technology. Uh, so one thing is that. The second uh, last thing I would like to mention is also commercial desks, such as chartering. Uh, we recently saw a big operator, for example, uh, replacing uh, some of its uh, chartering people with uh, executives from, from the telecommunications industry. So we see the nature of the, of the chartering business changing as well. It's becoming more logistics-oriented, more solutions-oriented, etc. So both the vessel and the, decision, and the commercial uh, people uh, offshore. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, Foti, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I agree with uh, Mikhail on that. I think uh, also for us, okay, we're not a shipping company per se, but we have our charting department. And uh, lately, uh, given this uh, high volatility, so charting has become, has become let's say, uh, more, uh, let's say, into uh, decision-making and trading. Uh, because um, they have also understood that it's very important to be ahead of the market changes and ahead of uh, of uh, the of the volatility in order to to catch the volatility on the right moment, but also, yeah, be on the safe side and um, have the right decision. So uh, I think chartering uh, has been uh, has been really, let's say, influenced by this uh, by all these uh, radical changes. To the pandemic and uh, these uh, uh, ballistic markets that we we have been seeing, like let's say lately. And you hear chartering desks; they increasingly uh, present their operation more like trading. So they yes. want to either outperform indices or optimize their trading routes. Exactly. So it's like a new landscape emerging. I see. Yes, because uh, let's say freight for us um, didn't used to be, let's say. A huge, uh, let's say, element of uh, of importance, if you like. Of course, it is important, but uh, now uh, with all these uh, changes, you it's uh, it's really important to enter the market at the right moment and make the right decision. Otherwise, it can be detrimental for your economics and your your trades. You have a panel to cover, I guess. And yes, like uh, with freight, especially at periods uh, when, you know, we yeah. see that it's a, a big cost. Uh, a big it's not only commodity. Uh, you yeah, like it's, also, it, right? it's also down to regions. Yeah. I mean, yes, exactly. It's more, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit more granular. I mean, of course, like you have uh, uh, vessels all over the world, but, you know, depending on the trade you have, uh, you want to... Uh, to focus in a certain region and, you know, uh, being able to provide analytics on, on the freight world and, you know, try to boost that way, like chartering uh, decisions, uh, for, uh, for instance, it, it is a challenge in order to be able to, to cover the costs. Uh, thank you once again, guys. So now we could, uh, uh, we could proceed uh, to the Q&A question. Uh, so the first question, which is uh, from our attendees prior to the to the webinar, is 
looking a bit back and not looking at you know like uh, which area of shipping is riper for analytics but which shipping industry or operation has uh, has changed the most um, who would like um, to take it uh, I can go on <laughs> perfect Anastasia. Um, so I believe again I'm not it's not like I'm working in those sectors or industries but I believe that port authorities uh, and ship owners have been the first ones within the maritime industry to see the benefits of analytics. Um, the big ports of Rotterdam, Hamburg, for instance, um, they're actively using uh, big data analytic solutions for their port and terminal operations, uh, for efficiency of cargo handling, for uh, optimization of uh, port facilities, for example. Uh, at the same time, we have seen ship managers um, elevating their, like their sophistication. Um, back to what uh, Michalis was saying uh, before, there is um, room for improvement there, but I think uh, they're trying to do their best in utilizing their data for safety reasons to start with, uh, crew management, uh, efficient bunkering operations, you name it. So I think at least from the port perspective and then the ship manager's perspective, those are the, big, the, the first ones uh, that started seeing the, the benefit of the use of analytics. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, Michalis or Fotis, would you like to add anything on Anastasia's point? Or should I continue with the next question? No, I agree with you, Anastasia. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the next question, it's uh, regarding, you know, uh, the, the Apple mobility data that uh, Fotis talk about. And the question is, is uh, from Vivek uh, Srivastava and it's like, uh, could you go into a bit more depth on the Apple mobility data? Uh, what is it? Where does it come from? Uh, what is it useful for? And you know, what other new indicators have uh, emerged recently? Uh, Fotis, would you like to, to give us an yeah. insight on how so, mobility data are used? So I I just gave an example about the, the mobility data. So the mobility data, what it does, uh, shows uh, the mobility uh, in, uh, let's say, different countries, or the data can be even more granulated in some uh, smaller regions. And uh, why is important? It's important uh, for the motor fuel consumption. Diesel and gasoline, let's say, consumption is very important to have a look at the mobility data because along with uh, other, uh, let's say, uh, information that you, that you have, uh, you can come in a, let's say, uh, approach of how the market will evolve and which is gonna be the demand on the short run, let's say, for motor fuels. Thank you for this. Uh, anyone else wants to add on, on this or maybe, you know, which other indicators we have seen? Um, in terms of the Apple data, I mean. <laughs> yes, perfect. Uh, this is, as Foti said, he already expand on this, but in general, not like there were not data out there. Um, tracking mobility, unfortunately, <laughs> through our mobiles. Um, but it's the necessity and the need for it not right now. So again, on the same basis, we have started tracking flights, for example, number of flights, number of uh, miles flown. Yeah. Because even though we started seeing flights, the number of flights going up, then you look at it and you're like, okay, they're more uh, within one country or within Europe, for example. So you have seen uh, the miles flown coming down with the impact on jet fuel, um, just as an indicator. So. There are some things that have emerged due to the pandemic uh, and there are related to mobility data primarily. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia, for this. Um, let's uh, proceed uh, with another uh, uh, question, uh, who, which is from Lakeham. Uh, and the question is, can you please provide an example on how analytics can help the decarbonization of the maritime industry? I think probably, Mikhail, you're uh, you know, fit to, to answer this question. 
Thank you, Yannis. That's great. Uh, interesting question. So analytics and decarbonization. I think, first of all, uh, analytics allow us to measure the problem. So to gauge the problem. And if you can measure something well, uh, then the solution is also much easier, like uh, to, to understand uh, what the issue is. Um, so that's the, the first point. The second point would be that analytics have given birth, of course, to many uh, many technologies that can actually help to, to directly reduce uh, emissions, whether this is uh, air lubrication, whether this is, uh, this is new engine models, new uh, vessel designs, etc. With regards to the engines, for example, uh, uh, let me make a, a quick example on LNG, perhaps, uh, that we can see how analytics uh, aids the decarbonization process by looking at the LNG engines, uh, and looking at their performance, how drastically it has improved. Because LNG engines are still a very, let's say, new technology relatively to uh, the oil engines. Uh, so it is, of course, technology and analytics that uh, helps guide this process towards continuous improvement. Thank you, yeah. I Would you like to add something, some, for you? Yes. yes. I think what is also important mm -hmm. to see is uh, are the biorefineries that are emerging let's say, year by year, uh, worldwide. So uh, so many refineries that, uh, let's say, they are old and uh, they need investment in order to, to keep going, they convert it into biorefineries to produce bioproducts like biodiesel, bioethanol, bionaphtha. And uh, we see, let's say, and we've been seeing countries considering uh, to, let's say, increase the percentage of the bio uh, biofuels into like gasoline, diesel, into the motor fuels, as an example. Thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, and would you like to add? Yeah, I think um, totally <laughs> guys. And um, one more point, I think it has to do with uh, like to come through operational efficiency as well. Um, at the end of the day, like big data, let's say they look for patterns by being able to identify those patterns with real time data, for example, um, you can develop new technologies and systems for uh, more efficient navigation uh, from routing optimization to vessel fuel uh, consumption predictions uh, to weather delays, uh, for example, uh, uh, forecasting that will help reduce emissions at the end of the day. Thank you, Anastasia. Yes, I totally agree, guys, with your point. And you know, like we should not like as a like uh, working in a data provider. This is also like how you can provide like accurate data and data, for example, about you know like the vessel certificates and like CIA indicators and like combine all of this to try to exped expedite uh, this way of you know adopting a decarbonization and like trying to assist charterers, for example, on the vessels they hire. But of course, like probably like you know. Um, in order for like the, the charter, of course, like with the with the whole you know like ESG movement, uh, we've seen uh, like they're pushing towards decarbonization, but of course, like probably also regulation has to come up at at a point. Uh, let's uh, now go to to the next question from uh, from an anonymous attendee, which is, uh, where do you see a fit for quantitative analyst in shipping? Uh, who would like to answer it? Ioanni, let me start uh, on that because I was having this discussion with a colleague of mine this morning, actually. So uh, I think that the age where we are, we're talking about market analysts, uh, quantitative analysts, it's slowly coming to an end. And uh, we are now approaching a new era where we have uh, basically a hybrid, uh, a hybrid analyst. Uh, that, of course, knows how to read the market, to understand the fundamentals, to keep, the, um, to keep all the data in place, and, and also actually build the models, uh, analyze the data, etc. So I think uh, this is the first uh, important uh, point, that we see the, the integration of, uh, of market analysis and data uh, analysis. Now, regarding the specific uh, sector, the specific segments of shipping, I think in every single segment uh, uh, of shipping, like the mainstream uh, segments, uh, having uh, data science skills uh, are key, even from a, 
from the perspective of knowing how to handle problems, to analyze uh, huge sets of information, etc. So that's the first point. Uh, in my role, uh, personally, on the market analysis side, I increasingly see it. I, uh, I am increasingly doing, let's say, more technical slash quantitative analysis, uh, etc. At the end of the day, um, data is a key key factor to, to guide the decision-making process. So, yeah, uh, as a segment, one last point, it would be mostly initially the paper, the, the segments that... Uh, are engaged in the paper market maybe uh, that uh, that would desire uh, such tools because we are speaking about uh, a bigger volume so when a, a vessel owner has a, a ship he may be doing like 10 trades per year i don't know off the top of my head you know like physical trades but when you're talking about paper markets you see huge volume of data so uh, quant skills are, are key in terms of forecasting in terms of doing anything Perfect. Thank um, you, Mikhail. Would you like to add an emphasis on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Mikhail and um, we have seen increasingly not only in job advertisements, uh, but also within our companies that um, it's an increasing trend. Uh, right now, next to the analysts, at least to my knowledge, pretty much every single company now gets this extra person, the data analyst. Um, for now, these, these people, they're completely unrelated, like there is someone doing the data part of it, either input or automation or uh, programming, you name it. Um, and then the analyst that can analyze all the results that come out of it. I think, and as an advice to the young ones out there, um, that the industry will require people in the near future that will be able to combine this, uh, the job that two people are doing right now, uh, to be able to have the programming part of it, the analytics part of it, and the analysis, the understanding of the market. Um, yeah. I totally uh, agree with you guys. Uh, this is what I've seen uh, from my company as well. And I think, I don't know if you agree that, you know, probably with uh, generational change, you know, like this combination, as you say, see see more professionals uh, having the best of both worlds, market analysis and expertise in data analysis. Would yeah, like same? And yeah. also, Ioannis, if I may add uh, on that, that uh, maybe the future generations may also be different in the sense that as the models are built, let's say uh, in the future, the computers themselves will be able to build the model, maintain the data, etc. And then when you want to interpret this, uh, this data, you may need someone that uh, actually has a different perspective. Maybe someone, you know, from the, you know, arts world or history world, so a, a fresh perspective because the hard science will be there. It will be built by the computer themselves. Of course, that's uh, looking at the long term, but just to anticipate maybe what will, will happen in the long future. Maybe we live to see the days of uh, prescriptive uh, analytics as well. Maybe, you know, maybe there won't be a need. Um, I doubt it for now, but. Who knows, like, like would be, we would get some actionable insights for the computer itself that, of course, would be from, you know, like, really competent uh, people that have the best out of uh, both worlds. Um, thank you, guys, for answering these questions. Uh, I believe we can uh, wrap up the discussion here. Uh, thank you all for this wonderful discussion and for sharing your thoughts on the matter. And thanks also for everyone that uh, tuned in and listened to this discussion. And uh, with that, I will pass back to you, Arthur. Thank you, Yanis, for moderating such a great webinar. And thank you to our panelists as well for, for joining us. And last but not least, our participants who took the time today. This video will be on our YouTube channel if you wish to, to rewatch it or share it with your network. Otherwise, wishing everyone a great rest of the day. And hopefully our 100th event uh, will be in person. Take care, everyone. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.